Psalm 145 is the last of the Davidic Psalms. And with this Psalm, we really encounter the beginning of the climax of the book of Psalms. The whole book of Psalms has really been driving towards praise as its ultimate destination, and we're now at the gate of that destination. You see, Psalm 145 begins the great crescendo of praise that really completes the Psalter in Psalm 145 to Psalm 150. As you can see from the title, Psalm 145 is a psalm of praise of David. Interestingly, this is the only psalm of all the psalms that has this title, a psalm of praise. And certainly it can be said in some sense that virtually every psalm is a psalm of praise, but this one is especially so. You see, one of the remarkable features of this psalm is the way that it uses so many different words for praising God. For example, it uses the word extol in verse 1 to speak of how great and how high and how lofty and how elevated and exalted God is. It uses the word bless in verse 1, verse 2, verse 10, and verse 21 to speak of gratefully acknowledging God's blessings to us and praising Him for those blessings. It uses the word praise in verse 2, verse 3, verse 21 to glorify and magnify God for His intrinsic excellencies and manifold perfections. It uses the word commend or praise in verse 4a to speak highly of God and to laud Him uses the word declare in verse 4b to speak of making known, making conspicuous to everyone God's mighty acts and mighty deeds. uses the word meditate in verse 5 to speak on musing on and even muttering to oneself about the intrinsic greatness of who God is and his essential being, his majestic being, and in what God has done in his wonderful works and amazing deeds uses the word speak in verse 6a to communicate the idea of verbally proclaiming the power of God's awe-inspiring acts. uses the word tell in verse 6b to speak of recounting and then relaying to others the greatness of God's character and deeds. uses the word eagerly utter or pour forth in verse 7a to speak of incessantly talking about the fame of God's abundant goodness and overwhelming kindness uses the word shout joyfully or sing aloud in verse 7b to speak of joyfully singing of God's righteousness and justice. It also uses the word give thanks in verse 10 to speak of all that God has made expressing their gratitude to God for who he is and for what he's done on their behalf. And so as you can see, this is no ordinary praise psalm. David has exploited all the vocabulary he can possibly muster here to describe this great activity of praising God for his greatness and his goodness. And not only that, but there are also repeated terms for the enduring nature of this praise. In verse 1, verse 2, and verse 21, he says that this praise will be forever and ever. In verse 4 and verse 13, he speaks of one generation to the next generation praising God. And so you can see that it's filled with praise to God and praise that should go on forever and ever and ever. Summarizing this psalm, Mark Futado writes, quote, David is the explicit subject of the verbs for praise in verses 1 and 2, verses 5 and 6, and verse 21. David, however, also envisions praise coming not only from himself, but also from others. These others include God's faithful followers, verse 10, but the choir for praising the God who is most worthy of praise, verse 3, must be comprised ultimately of everyone on earth, verse 21. But even a choir composed of everyone on earth is not sufficient. Nothing less than all God's works, verse 10, will do for the praise of the king of the universe. This grand choir will praise God now and forever and ever. And Amen. End quote. So this is certainly a praise psalm among all the praise psalms, as David seems to have saved his best for last here. And in this psalm, God, uh, in this psalm, God, the King of Eternity, is praised again for who He is and for what He's done, for what He's promised yet to do in the future. God is praised for His greatness as the King who reigns forever, and He's also praised for His goodness and His generosity toward all His creatures, especially to His own people, both corporate and individual. And what's so clear about this psalm, as is the case with all the psalms, is that this is informed praise. In other words, it's theology that is truth about God that leads to doxology, that is praise of God. Listen, folks, praise in the Bible is never mindless. 
It's never empty-headed emotionalism, like you see so much of in our day. Nor is it just empty-hearted intellectualism, just cold, dead orthodoxy going through a rote routine. Now, it's always a truth-filled mind that issues forth in an inflamed heart of passionate praise and unrivaled devotion to God. And specifically because this praise is based on the truth of who God is and what God has done and what God has promised yet to do, it's not altered or affected one iota by our circumstances. Folks, praise is not about us and our feelings and our emotions and our circumstances. Praise is all about God and his greatness. It's all about God and his unchanging nature and character. That's why David can say in verse 2, Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever, regardless of my circumstances, regardless of my feelings. Because you're always worthy of praise. And that's how God intended it to be. He's always infinitely and intrinsically worthy of praise, irrespective of feelings or emotions or circumstances. And therefore, there should always be an anthem of praise in our hearts at all times and in all circumstances. And that's what we see right here with David. Notice the psalm reads, a psalm of praise of David. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wonderful works I will meditate. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts, and I will tell of your greatness. They shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness, and I and, and will shout joyfully for your, of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all, and his mercies are over all his works. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your godly one shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. The Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Psalm 145 is a hymn of praise, again, where David praises God for his nature and his works. That is who God is and what God does. And he calls others to join him in that praise. And the interesting thing about Psalm 145 is that it's an acrostic psalm. That is, it's one of the eight alphabetical psalms where each verse begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, there's actually 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, but as you can see here in the NASB, there's only 21 verses listed. And the reason is, is because in the traditional Masoretic text of Psalm 145, there is no verse beginning with the Hebrew letter Nun. You would expect such a verse to appear as the 14th verse between what we call the Mem and Samic stanzas or verses. And the interesting thing is that several ancient witnesses, including one medieval Hebrew manuscript, the Qumran scroll from Cave 11, the Septuagint, and the Syriac all supply the missing Nun verse, which reads like this. The Lord is reliable in all his words and faithful in all his deeds. You might paraphrase the verse as follows. The Lord's words are always reliable and his actions are always faithful. Now, unfortunately, the NASB doesn't even give you a marginal note telling you that there are some manuscripts that include it. And unfortunately, the NIV includes it without even telling you that there are some manuscripts that don't include it. The ESV, on the other hand, puts it in brackets to let you know that there are some manuscripts that don't have that verse in them, and I think that's wisest and best. Personally, I think it's a credible verse. One, 
because of the ac acrostic structure of the rest of the psalm. That verse, if that verse is missing, you, you kind of lose the acrostic structure. And two, because the theology of the verse fits well with the rest of the psalm as well as the rest of the scripture. But regardless of whether you think the verse should be included or not, the theology of the verse is certainly true and contained in other passages of Scripture. Well, as we look at Psalm 45, 145 tonight, we're going to see that the psalmist's passion for glorifying our great and gracious God compelled him to compose a worship masterpiece of three swelling celebrations of praise followed by a coda, that is a concluding remark in verse 21. First, we see that he enjoys singing solo in his first celebration of praise in verses 1 through 3. Second, we see that he enlists the covenant community to join him in his second celebration of praise in verses 4 through 9. And then third, we see that he enlists all creation to, in, to join him and the covenant community in his third celebration of praise in verses 10 through 20. And in verse 21, we see that coda, that concluding remark there in verse 21. And so notice first that he enjoys singing solo in his first celebration of praise in verses 1 through 3. And notice here in verses 1 and 2 that his personal gratitude is voiced. Notice he writes starting in verse 1, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. And so David is just pent up with gratitude here, and he expresses that as he sings this solo to God. The first thing that I want you to notice here is the intentionality of this praise. Notice four times in these first two verses, David says, I will, I will, I will, I will. Do you see that? Verse 1a, I will extol you. Verse 1b, I will bless your name. Verse 2a, I will bless you. Verse 2b, I will praise your name. This praise is intentional. This praise is volitional. In other words, David's making a conscious choice, a conscious commitment of his will here to bless the Lord. That is to gratefully acknowledge the Lord's blessings to him and to praise him for those blessings. He's making a conscious commitment of his will to praise Yahweh for who he is and his essential greatness as God and as the sovereign king of the universe. And this is the way that our praise needs to be as well. It needs to be very intentional and directed specifically toward God based on what we know to be true about him as our God and our king. And so notice David begins here in verse 1 by saying, I will extol you. Literally, I will lift you high, God. That is, I will recognize you as high and lofty and exalted, kind of like you see in Isaiah 6. And as a result, I will lift you up in praise and celebration. Folks, God is exalted above all others. He is preeminent over everyone and everything in this universe. And when we extol him, we simply acknowledge and declare that to be so. And so when we extol God, we simply recognize him to be the transcendent one over all people and all things. And as a result, we praise him for his elevated and exalted status as the unique and one and only transcendent God. And so David says, I will extol you. And then notice the personal nature of this, my God, O King. David is extolling God here, not just as, as God, but as his God. As the God with whom he was in covenant relationship through repentance and faith in the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. When David says, I will extol you, my God, he's referring to God as the covenant God who is committed to him and to whom he is committed the one with whom David had a personal saving relationship. And notice he says here, I will extol you, my God. And then he adds this, O king, announcing a theme that he will later develop in verses 11 and following. And so David says, I will extol you. I will exalt you, my God, O king. God, you are the sovereign king. You are the one who sits enthroned over the whole universe, ruling and reigning over everyone and everything at all times. And therefore, I will extol you. I will recognize you and regard, and regard you as the exalted king of the universe, as the one who's preeminent over everyone and everything. Psalm 29.10 says, The Lord sat as king at the flood. Yes, the Lord sits as king forever. In other words, the psalmist says there that it was the Lord, Yahweh, who sat as the sovereign king over the great flood of Genesis, wiping out virtually everyone and everything in this universe except for eight people and some animals. 
And it is the Lord, Yahweh, who will sit as king forever after he eventually destroys all of his enemies and all of his rivals and sets up his eternal kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth. Folks, God is the great king of this universe and we're to recognize him and to extol him as such. And later in verses 11, 12, and 13, the psalmist will go on to talk about God's kingdom, his rule, his universal reign, his eternal reign. And so David begins by saying, I will extol you, my God, O king. And then in parallelism, he says, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Now this word bless here, barak, literally means to kneel. And so it provides an interesting word picture because in verse 1, David extolled God. That is, he elevated him. He lifted him up in his heart and in his mind and in his praise. Well, now in verse 1b, David blesses God. That is, he kneels before God. He lowers himself. He humbles himself in God's presence, acknowledging God's greatness and his own smallness. That's the literal use of this word, bless to kneel before, to bow before, but when it's used figuratively as it's being used here, the idea is to praise God, to gratefully acknowledge who God is and what God has done and in turn to bless him and to praise him. And so David says, I will bless your name. I will praise your name. Now the name of God here stands for all that God is and all that God does. David says, I will bless your name. I will praise you for who you are and for what you've done, God. And notice he says, I will do this forever and ever. This is speaking of a perpetuity of praise here. There's no end to this praise. There's no vacations from this praise. There's no lunch breaks from this praise. And then notice what David says next in verse 2. Every day I will bless you. Now folks, this is amazing. There's no off days for David from blessing and praising his great God and king. And the reason why this is so amazing is because every day is different, isn't it? Some days provide great pleasure, while other days provide great pain. Some days are filled with triumph, while other days are filled with tragedy. Some days are filled with gladness, while other days are filled with grief and sadness. And yet, regardless of what the day brings forth, David says, I'm resolved to bless you, to praise you, God, regardless of my circumstances. Incredible. David has made up his mind on the front end. He's not going to wait to see how the day goes. And to see how his circumstances unfold to determine his response toward God. Saying, you know, if things go well today, if things go the way I want them to go, then I'll bless you, God. Then I'll praise you. But if they don't, you can forget about it, God. Then I'm going to murmur and I'm going to grumble and I'm going to complain. I'm going to mope around in self-pity, trying to get people to feel sorry for me. Now, this worship is based on who God is not based on what David's circumstances are like. It's based on the unchanging nature and character of God, not on the ever-changing circumstances of David's life. And again, God is always infinitely worthy to be praised simply for who he is intrinsically and inherently in his being. That's what verse 3 says. He's a great God and therefore he's worthy of being praised. And folks, let me just say that the only way that you'll be able to bless and praise God every day, irrespective of your feelings and circumstances, is to resolve ahead of time to do so based on the unchanging nature and character of God. To do so based on who he is and what he's already done for you in Christ and what he's promised to yet do for you in the future as, when Christ returns and reigns forever. And so David says here in verse 2, every day I will bless you, God. And then he adds this, and I will praise your name forever and ever. That is not only throughout time, but throughout all eternity. This is amazing. Not even death will be able to cause David to cease from praising his great God. I'll praise you forever and ever. Let me ask you, folks, does that characterize your heart tonight toward God? Are you characterized by a resolute commitment to bless and praise God every day for who he is and for what he's done as your great God and your great king, irrespective of your feelings and emotions and circumstances? Are you characterized by whining and complaining and grumbling? Not the psalmist. He's resolved to bless and praise God every day and to do so forever and ever, not just throughout time, but throughout all eternity. Now, the obvious question at this point is, what is it that precipitated such exuberant praise in David's heart here? 
Well, the psalmist immediately answers that question in verse 3, where his preeminent grounds for praise are now verified. Notice here in verse 3 that he's essentially saying, the reason why I'm so excited about extolling and blessing and praising God every day and doing it forever and ever is because great is the Lord. Great is Yahweh, the sovereign, self-existent, self-sufficient one. The one who always is, the one who's always there, the one who possesses life within himself. He's great because he's unlike anyone or anything else. There are no other gods. There are none like him. He's great because he alone possesses life within himself. He's great because he alone gives to people life. He's great because he alone sustains people's life. He's great because he's dependent on no one and no thing, and yet absolutely everyone and everything is utterly and absolutely and completely dependent upon him for life and breath and all things. He's great because he is absolute reality. All else is real as he holds it into being. Therefore, everything that exists owes its existence to him, is contingent upon him, and therefore is less valuable than him. And therefore, he alone is worthy of the exclusive devotion and praise of all creatures. And so David says, great is the Lord. He's great in every way. He's great in his person. He's great in his works. There's nothing mediocre. There's nothing moderate about God. Great is the Lord. And therefore, he is highly, he is greatly to be praised. The praise of God should be commensurate with the worth of God, with the weight of God, with the greatness of God. If he's that great, then our praise should be great. In verse 2, David was actively praising God. Now in verse 3, he provides the reason why he's actively praising God. And interestingly, he uses a passive participle here. He says, God by nature is exceedingly praiseworthy. He's exceedingly worthy of praise ever and always. Psalm 18.3 says, I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Same passive participle. Psalm 48.1, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Psalm 96, 4, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. In Psalm 113, that great hymn of praise about both the transcendence of God, that is the holy otherness of God, as well as the immanence of God, that is the nearness of God to those in need. We read in Psalm 113, 3, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. It's a merism from the beginning of the day until the end of the day and all throughout the day, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Folks, God is worthy to be praised and to be praised greatly. True worship must always be proportionate to the object of adoration and therefore great praise is fitting for such a great God. Spurgeon writes, quote, No chorus is too loud, no orchestra too large, no psalm too lofty for the lauding of the Lord of hosts, end quote. And so David praises exuberantly because Yahweh is great and exceedingly praiseworthy. And then he adds at the end of verse 3, And his greatness is unsearchable. It's unfathomable. You can't even begin to plumb the depths of it to explore the ends of it. To, there is no limit to God's greatness. It's without limits. They don't exist. He's limitless in his greatness because he's infinite. Listen, even our greatest thoughts about God are infinitely small compared to who he is and his greatness. His greatness is utterly beyond and infinitely past finding out. Greatness is innate with God. He's a great God and therefore he's exceedingly worthy to be praised. And David says, I'm here to lead in that praise. And so first we see that he enjoys singing solo in his first celebration of praise in verses 1 through 3. Well, notice secondly now that he enlists the covenant community to join him in his second celebration of praise in verses 4 through 9. In verses 4 through 7, he first focuses on the community's privilege of praise, saying this, One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wonderful works I will meditate. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts and I will tell of your greatness. They shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness and will shout joyfully of your righteousness. And so now the psalmist is enlisting the covenant community to join him in his celebration of praise as he goes back and forth between the covenant community and himself. He's saying we shall all do this together and we should do this from one generation to the next. 
Notice in verse 4 that he says that we shall pass on the greatness of God from one generation to another generation, teaching them about the greatness of God and teaching them to praise God for his greatness, for his works. And so David envisions here a living chain of praise, a holy relay, as it were, in which one generation passes the baton of praise on to the next. Listen, folks, the ultimate legacy to pass down to your children, the ultimate legacy to pass down to the next generation is the greatness of God. It's not giving them an unlimited bank account. It's not giving them the best education in the world. Those things are great if you can do them, but the greatest thing, the greatest legacy you can leave the next generation is by telling them about God's greatness and teaching them to praise him for his greatness and teaching them to live in light of his greatness. Let me ask you, is that what you're passing on to your children? Are you passing on to the next generation the greatness of God and are you teaching them to praise God for his greatness? And are you modeling that for them in your own life? David says in verse 4, one generation shall praise your works to another. He's saying, we've seen your works, God. We've seen what you've done. And it truly is amazing. Not just in creation, speaking a universe into existence, but in recreation, in calling and establishing a people for yourself by your grace and your power. And we've seen your redemption of your people from Egyptian bondage and slavery. We've watched the ten miraculous plagues. We've watched the parting of the Red Sea. We've watched you provide manna from heaven and water from a rock and clothes that didn't wear out and protection from enemies and guidance and direction in the wilderness. And on and on it goes. We've seen your works, God. And then he says in the second half of verse 4, and shall declare your mighty acts. That is one generation to the next shall verbally declare, verbally make known, verbally make clear and conspicuous to everyone God's mighty acts and awesome deeds. And then in verse 5, he says, on the glorious splendor of your majesty, that is on who you are and on your wonderful works, that is on what you do, I will meditate. It says in the first half of verse 5 that he will meditate. He will spend time thinking about and pondering who God is innately and inherently in the glorious splendor of his majesty. Listen, folks, there is a great light. There is a great luster. There is a spiritual brilliance that emanates from the magnificence of God's majesty. God's majesty is blinding, it's breathtaking, and it's beyond comprehension or calculation. But then in the second half of verse 5, David says that he will meditate not just on who God is and his essential greatness, but also on what God has done. He will meditate not just on God's person, but also on God's power. Notice the second half of verse 5, and on your wonderful works I will meditate. The idea of meditation here speaks of a real intense focus contemplation. It's one that has a focus of internalization and then application. And so David says, who you are and what you've done, God, are absolutely overwhelming. They're more than my feeble, finite mind can even begin to fully grasp. And yet I'm going to meditate on them. I'm going to give deep, intense, focused contemplation to them so that I can praise you for them and truly live in light of them. Let me ask you, what is it that you spend your time meditating upon and thinking about? 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Everyone's given the same amount of time. How do you use that time? What do you focus upon? What do you meditate upon? Is it honestly on who God is and the greatness of his majesty and on what God has done in his works? Notice verse 6. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts. Literally, of your fearful or awe-inspiring acts. Your acts that inspire awe and amazement and astonishment and wonder and admiration. And I will tell of your greatness. I will publish abroad your greatness just like the heavens do every day, Psalm 19.1. Same word group. And so David not only meditates on God's greatness, he not only praises God for his greatness, but he's also committed to telling others about his greatness. And not only David, but men from one generation to the next shall speak of the mighty deeds of God that instill fear and awe and wonder within the hearts of those who behold them. There's a sense of striking wonder that only God could have done something like this. Let me ask you, do the people in your life ever hear you talk about God and his greatness and the awe-inspiring things that he's done? Well, then David says in verse 7, they shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness. 
Now, memorials were big in Israel. When God would do something great, they would often build a memorial with a pile of stones to continually remind themselves of it. It was something visible to trigger their mind, to bring their mind back to what God had done. The psalmist says here in verse 7, They, that is all God's people from one generation to the next, shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant, your overwhelming goodness. Listen, God is not just good, he's abundantly good. He's not at all meager in his goodness. He's overflowing in his goodness. And literally, David says, they will pour forth like a bubbling over spring the memory of your abundant goodness. And so not only is God great in verses 1 through 6, but now we see that he's also good. Can you imagine how horrific it would be if this great and powerful and awesome God were bad? Don't take his goodness for granted, but joyfully celebrate it and declare it aloud and rest confidently in it. And so David says, one generation shall eagerly utter and pour forth the memory of your abundant goodness. And he says in the second half of verse 7, and will shout joyfully of your righteousness, your justice, your concern to set matters right and straight. Sam Storms writes, quote, our God is righteous. To say that God is righteous is not to say he conforms to human standards of right and wrong. Rather, he conforms perfectly to the standards of his own perfections. But if he is wholly righteous, how can unholy and unrighteous people like you and me ever enter his presence? Well, thankfully, the answer follows in verses 8 and 9, where we see the promptings undergirding the community's praise here. Why all this exuberant on the part of the psalmist as well as the rest of the covenant community? Well, here are some of the reasons. The psalmist lists some of the great attributes of God which enable us to be in a relationship with God. He says, starting in verse 8, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all and his mercies are over all his works, over all he's made. And so notice this catalog of the attributes of God here that prompt praise. First, the psalmist says that Yahweh is gracious. This word refers to God's unmerited favor towards ill-deserving sinners. And notice how I said ill-deserving and not just undeserving. Again, it's not just that we deserve nothing from God. We actually do deserve something from God. We deserve God's wrath, God's judgment, and so we're ill-deserving. And that's what makes God's grace so utterly astounding, the fact that he not only withholds from us the judgment that we do deserve, but the fact that he actually gives us the blessing and favor and salvation that we don't deserve. And then second, the psalmist says that Yahweh is merciful. That is, he has pity and compassion on us when we are in misery and in need, and he acts to relieve that misery and to meet that need. That's exactly what God had done for Israel, delivering them from Egyptian bondage and slavery, and that's exactly what God has done for us in Christ delivering us from the penalty and power of sin. We were dead in sin. We were deceived and dominated by sin. We were destined for wrath and deserving of wrath as a result of our sin with no way to remedy our condition. But because God is merciful, he pitied us. He had compassion on us that compelled him to act on our behalf, that compelled him to deliver us from that perilous predicament at the cost of his own dear son's life. Incredible. Talk about a reason to praise God. Well, notice third, the psalmist says that God is slow to anger. Literally, he's long of nose in the Hebrew text. In other words, he has a very long fuse before he explodes. The idea is that he's long-suffering. He can suffer long under our sin and rebellion. He's patient with us. Thank God that he is, which is another tremendous reason to praise him. And then the psalmist says that he's not only gracious and merciful and slow to anger, he's also great in loving kindness. This is that great Hebrew word, chesed, again, that speaks of the abundance of his grace, of his covenant love and loyalty to his people. It speaks of the greatness of his loyal love toward his disloyal people, the greatness of his never-failing love to his ever-failing people. It speaks of God's unchanging love for and commitment to his people, who deserve just the opposite which is so amazing. And then in verse 9, he says, the Lord is good to all. In other words, not only is Yahweh good to his own, but his common grace goodness even extends to all people, even unbelievers. Psalm 119.68 says, you are good and you do good. God is inherently good in his character and he does good in his deeds flowing from that character. The major idea behind this word goodness is that God is concerned. He's concerned about the well-being of his creatures and he acts to promote it. 
And again, the amazing thing about God is that he does good to all of his creatures, even to unbelievers, as Jesus talked about in Matthew 5, 44 to 45, by sending rain on the just and the unjust and causing his son to rise on the evil and good so that unbelievers have crops to enjoy and food to eat. See the same thing in Acts 14. As Paul preaches a sermon to a bunch of pagan idolaters, and he reminds them of this in verses 16 and 17, where he says, In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, and yet he did not leave himself without witness. How did he witness to his reality? In that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. This is what we call God's common grace. He's good to all, believer and unbeliever alike. He's universally beneficent to all. And then the psalmist says here in verse 9, the Lord is good to all and his mercies are over all his works, over all he's made. You can see God's mercy over everything that he's made. And that universal goodness and beneficence of Yahweh now sets the stage for the psalmist's largest circle of celebration in verses 10 through 20. And so thirdly now we see that he enlists all creation to join him in the covenant community in his third celebration of praise in verses 10 through 20. And in verses 10 through 12, we see the reverberations of praise. Notice that he says here, starting in verses 10 through 13, we see the reverberations of praise. Notice he says, starting in verse 10, all your works... That is all your creation, all that you've made, both animate and inanimate, shall give you praise, give thanks to you, O Lord. That is, they shall express their gratitude to you. And your godly ones, that is literally all your begraced ones, all your covenant people to whom you've shown grace and favor to, shall bless you. They shall praise you. They've been blessed by your grace, God, and so they shall in turn bless you and praise you gratefully acknowledging your sovereign grace and goodness to them and positionally setting them apart and practically making them godly. Verse 11, they, that is your godly ones, your begraced ones, your covenant people shall speak of the glory of your kingdom. And so we already saw back in verse 1 that God is the king and now in verses 11 to 13 we're looking at his kingdom at his sovereign rule and reign which is what this word kingdom is all about. That's interesting. Verses 1 through 6 dealt with God's greatness. Verses 7 through 10 dealt with God's goodness. Now in verses 11 to 13, we're back to God's greatness again. These verses deal really with God's government, if you will. I say government because these verses are all about God's kingdom, God's rule, God's reign. Notice David mentions God's kingdom three times in verses 11 to 13, one in each verse. Starting in verse 11, they shall speak of the glory, the splendor, the greatness of your kingdom, your rulership, your sovereignty, your absolute dominion and authority. And talk of your power. Verse 12, to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your kingdom. Verse 13, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. And so God is a king over the kingdom of all mankind. We saw that in Psalm 103, verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. Folks, there are no maverick molecules in this universe. God is directing all things to their God-appointed end, causing all things to work together for the good of his people. And so we should praise God for his government, for his kingdom, for his sovereignty. Some people don't like to talk about the sovereignty of God, but not these people here. Verse 11a says that they speak of the glory of God's kingdom, God's rule. Verse 11b says they talk about his omnipotent power to rule and reign over all things. They love the meticulous sovereignty of God. In verse 11a, they talk of God's sovereign authority, his kingdom, while in verse 11b, they talk of God's sovereign power. And let me just say that there's a difference between authority and power. For example, if a large semi-truck is barreling down the highway and a policeman comes out to stop that truck and he puts up his hand and he says, Stop! In the name of the law! Does he stop that truck with his power or with his authority? He does so with his authority. Authority means that you have the right to do whatever you please. You have the right to rule. Now, power means you have the might to carry out all that your authority purposes to do. And folks, God has both. God has the omnipotent power to carry out all of the dictates and desires of his heart. That's what his kingdom, his sovereign rule is all about. 
And so the psalmist says in verse 11, they shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power. Why? Verse 12, to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your kingdom. And so here's the privilege of the reverberation of this praise. Not only the privilege to worship God, but to understand his kingdom unfolding in time, space, and history. And a part of that kingdom is the redemption of mankind and the privilege of passing on that message of redemption to others who don't know God personally and savingly. To witness to mankind about the great God that he is, about the powerful God that he is, about the gracious and merciful and long-suffering God that he is and the splendor of the glory of his kingdom. Folks, that's to be the passion and priority of God's people, to make known to the sons of men the mighty acts of God in salvation and redemption. That he is a king who is building a kingdom and ruling and reigning over that kingdom. He's redeeming people through the person and work of Jesus Christ, and we declare to people the kingship of God, declaring to them that God reigns and all people everywhere must bow in submission to his kingship or they will perish. Let me ask you, is that the passion? Is that the priority of your life to make known to the people around you God's kingdom? That God is a king, that God rules, that God reigns, and they must bow in submission to him or they will perish. It should be. Verse 12 says that we are to declare to them the majestic glory of his kingdom, of his sovereign rule and reign. Verse 13, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. In other words, God's sovereignty will never be usurped. It will never be overturned. His reign will continue forever and ever. Folks, whoever's in the White House right now will one day be replaced from that White House. But the one who is on the great white throne in heaven will never be put off that throne. His reign will never pass away as other empires do. It will never be overthrown as other dynasties are. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. It's an everlasting rule and reign. His sovereign dominion endures throughout all generations. Generations come and generations go, but God forever sits enthroned as the king of this universe. You see this all throughout the book of Daniel. Let me just read that. You don't have to turn there. Daniel 2.44. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Daniel 4.3. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. It's in Daniel 4, 34 to 35. But at the end of that period, that is at the end of that period of eating grass for seven years like a wild beast, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my reason returned to me. And what happened when my reason returned to me? I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. Why? For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? Nebuchadnezzar found that out the hard way, lifting himself up in pride against the king of the universe. That was Nebuchadnezzar, the king, acknowledging the true king, God, and his kingdom and praising him for his sovereign rule and reign over everyone and everything, which is an eternal rule and an eternal reign. Sam Storms writes, quote, Unlike every other ruler or potentate, God is in office for life. There is no transition team to move from one heavenly administration to another. There are no inaugural ceremonies. God has always been on the throne. There's no concern over the qualifications of a vice God should the Almighty be unable to serve out the full extent of his term. There are no tearful goodbyes to the staff, no waving so long from the steps of a helicopter, no cleaning out of the desk in the heavenly Oval Office to make way for his successor. Among earthly kings, especially in British history, we hear of James I and James II and Charles I and Charles II and Charles III, etc. Not in the heavenly kingdom. There is no Yahweh the first and Yahweh the second. For God is first and last and there is no other. None preceded him and none shall succeed him, end quote. And so no wonder he's so exceedingly praiseworthy, folks. 
Well, it's interesting. There's really an ebb and a flow to this psalm. The first stanza in verses 1 through 6 dealt with the greatness of God. The next stanza in verses 7 through 10 dealt with the goodness of God. And the third stanza in 11 to 13 went back to the greatness of God dealing with his government, his sovereignty. Well, now in the fourth stanza in verses 14 to 20, it comes back to God's goodness again, to his generosity. So there's a beautiful symmetry to the psalm. And here in verses 14 to 20, notice their reasons for praising him. According to verse 10, all creation, including all of redeemed humanity, is part of that chorus. And so you're talking about the whole creation and especially the redeemed community here. And the major theme of this section is God, the generous provider. And he's a provider concerning the regularities of life and concerning the emergencies of life. It doesn't matter if it's an emergency or if it's an everyday thing. God is a faithful provider. Now, here's that place between verses 13 and 14 where some manuscripts include another verse. The NASB doesn't even mention the textual variant, but this is how it reads. The Lord is faithful in all his words or in all his affairs and kind or loyal in all his works. The NIV says the Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving toward all he has made. And so you have extremes. You have the NASB not even mentioning it. You have the NIV including it and not even mentioning that there's some manuscripts where it doesn't appear. And whether it's included or not, those things are certainly true about God. And then notice verse 14. The Lord sustains, that is, he upholds all who fall, and he raises up all who are bowed down due to the blows of life. The sovereign God of the universe is tender towards those who are humble and afflicted, and he reaches down and picks them up. Spurgeon writes, quote, Admire the unexpected contrast. He reigns in glorious majesty, yet he condescends to lift up and hold up those who are apt to fall, end quote. But God not only raises them up, he also provides for them and supplies their needs. Look at verse 15. The eyes of all look to you, and the reason is because you give them their food in due time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. David says, God, you open your hand, meaning you supply, you provide. God is not a tight-fisted miser, folks. He opens his hand, providing all of our needs, and thus he satisfies the desire of every living thing. That is their desire for food and sustenance. And so, folks, you eat not ultimately because you open the refrigerator, but because God opens his hands and provides food on the earth for you to eat. If God didn't do that, you wouldn't eat and you would perish. Psalm 104, verses 27 to 28 says, They all, that is man, beast, and every other creature on earth, they all wait for you, God, to give them their food in due season. You give to them, they gather it up, you open your hand, they are satisfied with good. See the same thing in Jesus' words in Matthew 6, 25 to 34, where Jesus commands his people not to be anxious about food and clothing and other things. It says, God knows what you need. Look at how God feeds the birds of the air and provides for the lilies of the field. He's faithful. He'll provide for you too. Just seek first the kingdom of God that is God's rule and reign over your life and all these other things will be added to you. Spurgeon writes, quote, The living God has suitable supplies at hand and these he gives till inward satisfaction is produced and the creature sighs no longer, end quote. Look, God is good to his creatures. He's a generous and beneficent provider. It's like we saw in Psalm 23 verses 5 through 6, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. We have many overflowing cups at our dinner table, mostly because our kids spill them. (laughs) But here the psalmist says in Psalm 23 that our cup overflows because God just keeps giving and giving and giving to us in abundance. He's a generous God. He's not only great, but he's also good and generous. And we ought to praise him for that, David says. God is generous. His hand is open to supply and to satisfy our needs. And then the psalmist says in verse 17, the Lord is righteous. That is, he is just in all his ways, not just in the circumstances that favor us. And he is kind in all his deeds, not just in some of them or most of them, in all of them. What a comfort in the midst of trial and tragedy to know that God has kind and gracious purposes, that he's working all things together for our good, that we're not victims of fate. But even this difficult circumstance comes from the hand of a kind and gracious and loving sovereign God for our ultimate good. And notice here in verse 18 that while God is this great sovereign king over all the universe, he's also very near to those who call upon him. Verse 18, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, 
That is, to all who call upon him in truth or in sincerity. Now, folks, the Lord is always near to all people because he's omnipresent. But the idea here is that he's near to all who call upon him in truth in the sense that he's near to help them and to bestow his grace upon them. He's not near to dispense his grace and help to those who are wicked and sinful and proud and don't call upon him. He's not near to dispense his grace and help to those who call upon him hypocritically. But he is near to dispense his grace and help to those who call upon him in truth, the psalmist says. That is, in the sincerity of their heart based on who God is as revealed in his word. Deuteronomy 4, 7 says, For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God whenever we call on him? And so he's a great God. He's an awesome God. He's a powerful God. He's a transcendent God. And yet, amazingly, he's very near to those who call upon him. Verse 19, he will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. Kind of an echo of verse 16, where David said that God would satisfy the desire of every living thing. Here he says that God will fulfill the desire of all who fear him and who demonstrate that fear, that reverence, by characteristically walking in his ways. Do you want to be satisfied? Do you want to be truly fulfilled? Then fear God, reverence God, and walk in his ways. That's the only path to true fulfillment and satisfaction, living in the fear of the Lord. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. That is, bring temporal deliverance to those in difficult and distressing circumstances. Verse 20, the Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. And notice that those who fear God in verse 19 are the same ones who love him in verse 20. And so the fearers are the lovers and the lovers are the fearers. They don't contradict each other. And so God is a keeper, a guardian, a watchman who never slumbers or sleeps. He continually watches over and keeps all who love him and demonstrate that love for him in a life of patterned obedience. Spurgeon writes, quote, They keep him in their love and he keeps them by his love. But notice the contrast here. But all the wicked, on the other hand, all the unregenerate, all the unbelieving, all the morally wicked and rebellious ones, he will destroy. And so he's near to the ones calling on him in truth. He gives them their desires because their desires are his desires. He gives them their desires because they're responding to him as the sovereign king of the universe in reverence and fear. But the wicked ones, the ones who refuse to recognize him as king and who refuse to fear him, to submit to him as king, He will destroy. He'll condemn forever. And then he ends this psalm in verse 21 in the way that he began this psalm with intentional praise being given to God. Notice verse 21. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. This is amazing. Simply saying forever wasn't enough for David. So he added and ever. He permits no loopholes. One day we shall cease praying. One day we shall cease hoping. One day we shall cease watching and waiting. But David says, we will never cease praising. Adam Clark writes, quote, Through all eternity to thee, a joyful song I'll raise. But, O oh, eternity's too short to utter all thy praise. Listen, a heart full of thoughts about the splendor of who God is and what God does can no more conceive of an end of praise than it can conceive of an end of God. And may this be our heart tonight. May there be a resolute commitment of our hearts to praise God for who he is and for what he does and to do so every day forever and ever. And may we be committed to calling others to join us in that praise because the Lord is great and he is worthy to be praised. Remember that the psalmist started out solo. Then he added the covenant community. Then he added everything in the creation that you can see all around, that he could see all around him. He says, everyone sing out in praise to the true God, the sovereign of all. And then he finishes with this solo in verse 21. Now, Revelation 4, 9 through 11, we basically see the culmination of this corporate and communal praise. Listen to what John writes. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever. 
and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. And then in Revelation 5, 11 to 13, he says, Then I looked... And I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. They were innumerable. You couldn't count them. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in the heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them. That's all of creation. I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And that's what the psalmist was doing in Psalm 145, leading the people to corporately praise God for who he is and for what he's done. How much more should we praise God and call others to join us in that praise, having experienced the redeeming grace of God in Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Father, what a rich, rich psalm. We know that virtually every psalm is a psalm of praise, but we're overwhelmed. We're swimming and drowning in praise right now because you are a great God and because you're so great, you're greatly to be praised. Our praise should be commensurate with your greatness. There's no limit to your greatness. There's no end to your greatness. And therefore, there should be no limit and no end to our praise. Forgive us, God, for not being grateful, for not being thankful, for not worshiping you and praising you. Forgive us for being discontent and dissatisfied by the circumstances of life, focused upon ourselves and our circumstances, grumbling, complaining, murmuring, or perhaps not doing that, just being distracted by other things that are so much less significant than you, so much things that are pale in, 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 in comparison to your greatness. Becoming enamored with the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. Lord, I pray that you would recalibrate our minds through this psalm to to just be overwhelmed once again with the greatness of who you are and what you've done. And that we would be intentional and focused upon meditating upon your greatness. And that as we do, it would spur us on to praise you every day forever and ever. And it would spur us on to talk about your greatness to others, to share it with the next generation, to share it with those around us and to encourage them to give you praise. Lord, I pray that that would be the tone and tenor of our life, that that would be the desire of our heart and the direction of our life. Because you are a great God and you are worthy to be praised. And may we lead out in that praise and may we call others to join us in it. We ask it now in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.